Elementary music teacher friend, you love what you do, but you might feel unappreciated and, in fact, unseen some days. You may even feel like you're on a music teacher island and just want to connect with other music teachers who can relate to both your struggles and wins when it comes to teaching elementary music. I get you and understand completely the feelings you're having. That's why each and every week, the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast will provide you with solo and guest episodes that will help you realize you're not alone in your music teaching journey. Throughout each episode, my goal is for you to be able to walk away with actionable steps and ideas to help you feel like you're ready to take on the new week with whatever challenges may be thrown your way. Hi, I'm your host, Jessica Peresta, and I'm so glad you're here. Whether you're at home, in your car, in the shower, or wherever else you're listening, grab your cup of coffee or whatever other beverage is nearby and listen in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. I'm super excited to be joined by Deb Baldwin today, and we're going to talk about something I actually have not talked about on the podcast So I was super excited to meet her and to discuss drama education because I know several music teachers listening right now, you either do drama and music education or you're asked to bring drama into your classroom in one way or another. And so we're going to talk about all the things today. Before we do, Deb, I would love for you to introduce yourself, yourself, excuse me, let us know a little bit more about you and we'll go ahead and dive right in. Sure, Jessica. Well, thank you for asking me to be part of this interview. This is terrific. I was a drama teacher for 38 years. I taught in the public and in the private school classroom. I uh, taught every grade, uh, second through 12th, over that time, not like all the time. Generally, I taught middle school or upper upper elementary. I had a youth theater company. I've had four of them. I've, I have a tendency to create them and administer them for people for a while, administrate them for a while, and then I hand them off, and then I move on, because I really like the creativity of starting them. Now, I have retired, finally. My husband is a, was an instrumental music teacher, and so he, he's a little bit older. He retired first, then I retired, and so now I am mostly selling uh, drama education projects, products online through Teachers Pay Teachers. I have a, I have a website. I have a blog. I have everything known to man on social media. Um, I was an M, an indie author of a middle grade, middle grade book. Um, and I just enjoy drama to the nth degree. Anything that has to do with it. I'm a rock star grandma. I have three wonderful, of course, perfect grandchildren. And I've uh, been married to my husband for nearly 40 years, which is, I don't know who'd be married to me that long, but God love this man. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I say. We just, we re- just reached 15 years and I was like, I feel like that's a feat, but 40. Wow. That's a goal. Good for listen, you. Listen, girl, it, it just, it just gets easier over time because you just know each other so well. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the, what the cutoff point is for that. We're like, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> and we've certainly had our trials and tribulations, but the older we get, the closer we are, if that's possible. So anyway, I love it. I love it. A little bit about me. Hey, so I didn't know your husband was an instrumental music teacher. That's awesome. Yeah, I can't be all bad, you know. Yeah. So you yeah. guys are both just involved in the arts, and that's amazing. Yeah. In fact, I met him um, on Music Man a million years ago. I was playing Marion Peru because I used to perform quite a bit. <clears throat> and Tim, we needed a conductor for the orchestra, and they were trying to find someone. And he had just started at the high school in Columbia, Missouri. And somebody said, well, ask this guy. And they brought him in and he's wonderful. He is so um, sensitive when he conducts and I love to be conducted by him. And I thought, ooh, 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 who is this guy? <laughs> and that is really how we got started. It was about 40 years ago. So it's a very romantic okay. story because I'm singing yeah. My White Knight and I'm talking about this person. And guess what? He was right there. So I just didn't know it yet. So that's yeah. awesome. I love it. Oh, what a cool story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, um, one thing I was thinking about before we had this conversation, I've shared on this podcast before that my teaching journey starts at a school that hadn't had music for seven years. And I've shared before that in these closets or these cabinets, whatever, they're like the big giant closet cabinet looking things in my classroom were some old drama clothes that were just buried back in the closet. And I had found out that not only had there not been music for seven years, it had also, before me, a long time ago, had been used as the drama room. And I'm like, 
wow, look at all the, it was like buried treasures in there, like costumes mm -hmm. and costumes. And so it got me thinking and I talked to some of the teachers who had been putting on plays before I got there as the music teacher. And that was kind of my first exposure to drama. Mm -hmm. And before that, you know, because going through my college program, we didn't talk about it, unfortunately, mm -hmm. where you're sometimes asked as the elementary music teacher to put on a musical or do right. a drama with the kids, but you're like, what do I do? Nobody's ever right. told me how. So oh. what is drama education? I know it's different across the border, mm -hmm. wherever you go, but what can it look like in an elementary setting? Well, that's a really good question. There's two ways you can go with that. One is drama integration. And my master's is in arts integration and creative arts learning, which is essentially integrating the arts into the classroom. And I'm very, I'm very, very, uh, my expertise is primarily in that uh, for drama integration. Now, I taught, directed, administrated, produced, whatever. I did all of that in and out of the classroom. If you are an elementary music teacher, um, there are short plays and musicals that one could put on. Um, I know particular companies that are the best. Some are very expensive, some are not. It, it, it sort of depends on the person's need. People have a tendency to think, well, I'm just going to, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just going to do what my high school teacher did. Well, that's right. great, but that's high school. These are young kids, young students um, up to age uh, grade five. It should only study creative dramatics. It's all about them. It's all about what they receive from the experience. It is not about an audience. If you can hear them, that's great. But that's not for you, mom. It's for them. And it's to help them build their imagination, use their creativity, learn how to work with other people and learn just the basics to drama. There are something called uh, the components of theater. So we're going to look at uh, chanting and rhythm and sound effects and tableau and movement and storytelling, and there's several others. So I suggest people who are teaching K to five just concern themselves with creative dramatics. Then when sixth, when sixth grade comes, now we start to look at it from an audience's point of view, and it becomes more difficult over time, not right off the bat. In fact, I have taught up to seventh grade just teaching them the components of theater. Many times um, people come in with no experience and think, oh, well, I'll just use improv or I'll hand them a script. Oh my gosh, please do not do that with young kids. They First off, there's a reason we improv and it's not for fun. I mean, yes, it's fun, but right, right. it's not supposed to be whose line is it anyway. <laughs> it is not supposed to be a babysitting service. Oh, I don't know what to do with them. Oh, they'll love this. <laughs> and I don't mean it like it sounds, but I kind of do. That, right, that right. we're not there to entertain them. We're to teach them and help them appreciate it more so they become really good audience members. If in time they really want to study it, well, now we'll get, we'll become um, more serious about it when we're up into high school. But until then, it's all about what they receive from that experience, mm -hmm. you know, and wow. um, that's kind of how I've approached it all these years. Yeah. So when you're working with, let's say, even classroom teachers, helping them integrate drama into their classroom, whatever grade mm -hmm. level that might be. What are some tips you share with them? Because I know music teachers listening who have been asked to integrate drama into the music room. I know they can take some of those tips with them into their classrooms as well. Mm -hmm. You need a system um, and it, which has to do with a procedure. So you need to know what your procedure is. How do you start them? Um, how do you build? What do you say to them? But you, can, you mustn't just jump in and think, well, we just rehearse. N no. We, we need to warm them up, just like you do in music. We need to give them the objective so they know what we're going to do that day. If, if you're starting with a brand new script, my suggestion would be that you read it aloud with the group. You make sure the students understand the story. You have them tell the story back to you. Okay, now we've gotten that far. And now, if they want to uh, integrate drama into their lesson, it depends on what it is. So let's say they're teaching, mm -hmm. Um, about the Civil War. All right, well, we can dramatize moments in the Civil War, or we can do tableau, which is frozen stage pictures, of particular moments in the Civil War. And that's a super easy way for teachers to integrate drama. Or what would so-and-so have said at this moment, I, I'm the typical Oregon Trail. So what would people have said at this moment if their oxen has died, now what are they going to do? 
it makes, it brings all of that to life. You can do the same thing with science. You can do the same thing with math. You can do this, the same thing with, of course, language arts. It's, a, it's very simple once you understand it. It doesn't have to be grandiose. It does not have to be this huge performance. We don't have to have programs. We actually don't even need to have um, costumes. Uh, you can do everything bare, bare bones. So you, you, have to, you have to go where they are <clears throat> and you have to slowly build. Um, with young students, I suggest that anybody up to about second grade, the teacher narrates the story and the students act it out. If I was an elementary teacher and I wanted to do a play, that is what I would do with them. I would find maybe two or three students in that group who could maybe say one line all by themselves. They're gregarious. They seem to have no problem standing up there. The teacher narrates the story. The kids act it out. You would plan it, but remember, you're not going to always get what you think. Yeah. And then one person says a line at this point, the teacher goes on with the story. You can do that with reading too. I mean, there's just so many ways. It's very, very easy, but you do need a system. Mm -hmm. And um, not everybody knows the system. And the system is basically a, a basic procedure to follow. And I, I would say the biggest problem, the, the thing that worries me the most is pushing, pushing, pushing them. Please don't. In fact, when I talk to youth theater company um, directors around the world, I've been speaking to someone from Sri Lanka. She said, this is my biggest challenge. These parents push these students and now they're burned out and they're only in fifth grade. Now we don't want that. We wanna find the student who's the least likely and show him or her a place for them in this because there's a place for everybody in theater. We just have to find it, you know? Right. Yeah, I think there's a misconception about theater or drama that like you said, it's not just about the performance. It's not just mm -hmm. about the putting on the play. And when you say the word drama, that's what a lot of times what comes to mind. It's just the same for a music teacher. A lot of times they think they're just there to put on the performances and programs. And there's right. so much more that goes on in the music room, you know, and it's like the art teacher. It's not just about the art show. <laughs> it's like, right. You, you know, and so I, oh, it's just all these barriers you got to break down. But while you were talking about different types of expression and uh, like speaking even and reading a story and having the kids do movement to the story, a lot of that already happens in the elementary music room. And so teachers listening, you know, you're probably doing already drama integration in the music room without even realizing it. While That's you're right. reading a story and the kids are getting up and moving or acting out the words that mm -hmm. you're speaking yeah, yeah. or you're asking them to listen to a piece of music and asking them to describe how does it sound and or move your body mm -hmm. in the way it mm -hmm. sounds all this is drama right so yes, what is. are yeah so what are some ways elementary music teachers specifically i know i just mentioned some but are there other ways that they are maybe already integrating drama into the music room or that they can i think it's more less than if you're doing it then relax and allow yourself to do it mm. and don't worry about it just don't worry about it it's like right. well we're trying to choreograph this number but you are doing movement they will never forget that piece of music because you had them act like a chicken at that moment, which are the most endearing pieces. A good friend of mine used to co-teach with me out in Colorado. And I love to watch the kindergarten kids in that group because <laughs> they are so into being a chicken and I just love it. Yeah. And, and everybody's chuckling, but, but those kids are up in their heads. You know, the kids mm -hmm. you've seen on like Facebook that they, that are in their own world and everybody else is singing like this, you know, but the mm -hmm. one in the middle is like, Expressing. that student is already there. You yeah. do not need to worry. These other students, you have to help them, um, give them permission. I do things like I turn the lights down. Um, if I'm really instructing them, I turn on background music. It seems to sort of put a, a security blanket over it. But I don't find that elementary kids are difficult to um, pull out. They're very easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like any student. Once they trust you, even way up into high school, once they trust you, they they will do most anything that you ask them. I ask a lot of students. I, I expect them to live up to their potential, but not with the little ones. I'm just trying to, we just move forward. They're going to reach oh. it when they're supposed to. And it, it might not be me. It, I mean, they may not hit it until they're like in 17, you know, and for me, I have students have gone on professionally. I have students who became playwrights and directors. In fact, one is very famous and won a Tony award, but I don't, that's not who I am. I am for mm -hmm. the student. I had a student recently write on Instagram for me. He has cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And he, when he was in school, the kids bullied him. And he, 
he couldn't eat, he could hardly sleep. And this is probably when he was about nine and they tried everything, right? But they tried sports, they tried this and that. And then his grandma said, well, let's try putting you in this drama camp. And they did. And Matt just found it. He Aww. felt a sense of belonging because we work as a team and we accept, we truly accept everybody from where they are. It, we don't care if you have the most muscles, you run the fan fastest or you can sing the best. We want, we kick, we, everybody can be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And Matt has flourished and grown and flourished and grown. And he's decided he wants to be a drama teacher, which of course, that's great. From my point of view, that's wonderful. But just to watch Matt go from for six or seven years and watch him just slowly flourish up to playing lead roles and singing and taking private lessons and being in choir, you know, and show choir. This is big. This is Uh really big. That's who I'm for. You know, that's Uh the ones, those are the ones I'm looking for. And that's what I mean when I say I look for holes in the curriculum. How can I reach those students Mm -hmm. that no one has found, you know? Mm -hmm. So probably, I would say probably a lot of elementary teachers are already doing a lot of it. It's an individual thing. I almost have to get in there and just see what they're doing. But mostly I would say, just give yourself permission. And, um, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm just selling my products, but honestly, I can help you if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. I can also send you to books and um, in particular, everybody should own this book called Improvisation. No. Theater Games for the Classroom. It's by Viola Spolin, and that's S-P-O-L-I-N. You can find it probably any major bookstores, or you could order it online. Everyone should own this. Viola is sort of the grand dame of improvisation for the actor. And then she and her son um, wrote the theater game. So they took her improvisation uh, methods, and then they turned them into games for kids so that it, oh my gosh, and it's oh, cool. Yeah. And it's easy. It's uh, everybody should own it. For instance, there's one in it I love called um, Explosion Tag. So you get them out there and I play it my own way. But um, essentially they're playing tag. But when they tag you, then you explode like a firecracker. And then you can't have that person be it and move on. Or the person that taps you, you explode, they go on to the next one. And every stops and watches, you know, so it's a do you know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. drama, yeah. but it's a game at the same time. Right. And I have them do it at least two times. Sometimes we do it all in slow motion. Sometimes we only make the sound. Sometimes we only make the movement. Um, and it's something anybody can do. Uh, Viola also has side coaching in the book. So I just can't say enough about this particular book. Um, um, you know, so that's dr- using drama games with them w- will help everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oh, yeah, for sure. And I love that you said that kids definitely find themselves in drama or music that feel like they can't find a place anywhere else. It just it is a very inclusive space. Everybody Mm -hmm. belongs. Everybody can accomplish like feel accomplishment in there. And so I love that you said that that is something that is very true for the arts. (laughs) It's just Mm -hmm. something kids feel a sense of belonging. And yeah, I love that so much. So I know personally there are teachers that are asked to teach, oh, you're the elementary music teacher. Okay, I want you to also teach drama and use the standards. And they're like, wait a minute, I, I can't, that's two things. So mm-hmm. teach, because mm-hmm. I know this personally, I have teachers that have told me this has happened to them. How, if, a, if an administrator approaches an elementary music teacher and says, we want you to also follow the drama, the drama standards, what do you suggest they do? Do they just sit down and look at the standards, see how they can like merge them? Or like you said, just not stress out about covering every single concept mm-hmm. throughout, the, you know, what would be well, your suggestion? I would say that person obviously does not know the arts very well. <laughs> right. And, and I, I, that always bothers me when they sort of bring you in on this pretense, but then they also say, but also we'd like you to teach PE. Really? There are, lessons online there's a book that i don't think it's still um in in print but it explains year by year by year what kids should learn and it's simple simple stuff so like choral reading when should they learn how to be able to speak chorally well shoot you're already doing that in choir okay so if you just took the lyrics and did it as a choral reading and you conduct it, it's great fun. I've done this before. We've taken a poem and I've been their 
uh, conductor. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have them be louder at this section. And, and, and what you're all you're doing is teaching them how to be expressive in their speaking. And they love it. And there's safety in numbers because they're all there together. So if, if I mess up, it won't matter. Um, I, I would say do what you can to tra translate the particular mm -hmm. objective and just you just need to talk to somebody with expertise and say, hey, Deb, is this, is, am I doing it? Yes. Or can you suggest how, just get me started. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. fine. I can get you started. And sometimes that, you know, that's all you need. You need to yeah. know that, oh, you're out, you're on the right road. Right. Yeah. And as you're talking a lot of, I know ORF training, are you familiar with mm -hmm. ORF? Okay. Yes. Like uh -huh. a lot of that is bringing well, not all of it, but a lot of it is bringing in speech pieces and turning it into music and bringing an expression of how you speak it. And so it sounds like a lot of, or maybe not a lot, but some of the drama standards are mm. probably similar or merge well with the music standards without even right. realizing it. You know, it's like, right. it probably is, it is a case by case basis for sure. Uh, right. But like you said, a lot of elementary music teachers, you're already integrating drama you maybe just didn't realize right. you were doing that now something i do that most people don't do and there's some reason i even provide i have scripts uh, my husband writes the music because he knows what the music because he taught elementary through high school and he's a composer and so he has written music for my plays which are very short and i have readers theater we do the same thing with those and i provide blocking on my scripts so physical movement so nobody has to worry about kids standing in a long, straight line mm -hmm. i actually tell you this person's going to cross down right and they're going to turn and they're going to say da -da -da -da, which is what if i was directing that's what i would tell them now the reason you don't find those is in scripts is because in the big world in the grand large world of theater they expect the the actor to find the movement themselves from an intrinsically motivated point. But young kids, of course, are not gonna do that. And um, so I always provide blocking to people. So they go, and so they're gonna have, I want them to have as much success as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And I, all my scripts are written for element, with elementary in mind, pretty much, well, for a while there, it was like fifth to seventh. Now I'm, I'm going down to second and up, but then I have high school stuff too. So I, but again, Jessica, I know what it is that's missing. And I right. have watched mm -hmm. my own daughter struggle with not having blocking and not having direction because they're both equally experienced and one wants to be and get her master's or finish her master's in drama uh, to teach. And I've watched them be frustrated in situations and, mm -hmm. or you run onto a script that there's one particular script that Disney owns and it the scene changes out of nowhere. Well, most people don't know that. They don't know, hey, guess what? You can bring the lights down and you can bring them back up and now we've made another scene. Just because mm -hmm. it's not in there, they think, well, it's not in there, but that's because it's either was sloppily put together or uh, somebody missed it or they don't see what the problem is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So expertise is something that you find over time. It also depends on just how serious you want to be about it. I mean, for mm -hmm. instance, if you have a principal says, well, we want you to integrate drama, I would go back to them and say, so are you going to pay for a play? Mm. Are you going to pay the royalties for uh, a Disney kids version? So I can use one of those because those are good. Those are really good scripts. They're not very long, but they cost money. And, right. and or do you just want me to kind of under your breath, do something dopey, you know, because you can, you can find dopey scripts out there too. Um, and you can find a lot of good ones. It just depends on, I, I don't even know what I would say to our teacher, mm -hmm. to a principal that asked me to do that. I'd say, I'm not qualified in that area, mm -hmm. um, but I'll do my best, I guess, yeah. you know? Right. And there are particular, right. I'm sorry, there are particular states <clears throat> that like Texas, California, New York, I want to say Georgia, which kind of comes out of nowhere, have drama all the way K through 12. Most don't start until they're in sixth grade and in middle school, but right. there are some states and those are the ones that buy from me the most because they, ha they're having to churn out so much material. Don't yeah. worry about too much or go back to them and say, how would you like me to do this? Or how serious are we going to be? Or, you know, mm -hmm. great advice. Yeah. And you're right. It just depends on the school in the state for that matter of yeah. what the requirements are. Yeah. It is a case by case basis, but it's okay to know your boundaries and what you're mm -hmm. comfortable with and to have a conversation in a respectful way about, you know, you want me to do this, but I'm not qualified, or maybe you don't say it that way, but say, if you want me to do this, you're going to need it. Like you said, provide the resources for me to be able to 
Right. Or maybe, or it, maybe it's training. Maybe it is like a, a play you need to buy, you know? Right. Um, that's what I would suggest. Um, some people buy into um, memberships that are misleading, um, that make you think, oh, I'm going to get all this stuff for free. Um, I, I don't believe in and don't agree with that particular marketing technique. I think that's very um, misleading to people. And you have to ask yourself right there, why would you purchase from those people? You want to pit, purchase from a trusted source, an experienced source. That's why I bring up Viola Spolin, mm -hmm. someone who's done this a long time. Somebody who has been, who has really been in there and knows what's going on. I've directed um, in an elementary. I took over a magical dinner for a friend of mine who was ill at the middle school and I finished off her play for them. You know, I've stepped into a children's theater that um, fired the director. And um, so those are all different situations. You know, oh, yeah. one wanted a lot, one wanted a little, one wanted it, had no idea. I want to ask you, we did talk about musicals just quickly pass by. And we know that's not the end all be all for drama, of course. Right. But there are a lot of elementary music teachers everybody's different. We, we keep talking about that in this episode, but it's true. Some are asked to put on just simple performances where the kids stand up there and sing. Some right. administrators want the performances to be theme-based. And some I know are asking these mu music teachers to put on full-blown musicals. And right. maybe they've just never done it or they don't even know where to start <laughs> when it comes right. to putting on a musical. So is there a step-by-step -step approach to like, what would be the first thing? Like look over the script and then right. work on the music first and then incorporate the drama into it or how, okay. I know that's all that we could be here all day talking about that, but what are some simple steps for elementary music teachers who are asked to put on a musical, but maybe they've never done it before and it's overwhelming. Okay. If you don't have very much money, then you go to the <laughs> smaller public published companies. Um, one's called Pioneer. Um, I think Eldridge Press is still out there. There's several others. Now, a lot of them have gone like Baker's Place, if they've heard of that, Samuel French, um, Music Theater International, Rogers and Hammerstein, Tams Whitmark. Several of those have gone come, since the pandemic, have pulled together under a new company called Concord Theatricals. And, and so if you, if you go to them, it's you, you ask for perusals of the script, you get that for free, and then you probably will have to send it back or maybe not. And then you sign it, you ask for a contract and you explain to them how many performances you're going to do, um, how much you're going to charge and that sort of thing. And then they give you a, a, a royalty price. Okay. Um, it, it, it can be quite expensive. And it can, if you go with the big companies, if you go with little companies and you do like Tom Sawyer, there's a musical version of Tom Sawyer and I can't remember which company. The royalties are going to be less. If people don't know about that, I feel like maybe I need to write a blog post about this. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, you pay more in the first performance than you do in the second or third. So you, you're going to pay this money up front. They're going to send the scripts to you. Most of the time now, the kids can keep the scripts or you could say, I need these all back at the end, which personally just give that idea up because you're never going to get them and you're not going to like how they look anyway. Mm -hmm. So just give, let the kids have them because we want them to eat, sleep and breathe this for the rest of their life. Right. So mm -hmm. you never know when they'll pick that up and go, you know what, I'm going to try to play. And when I did this with Mrs. Smith, and I'm going to try it. Um, and you can do, you know, pick one up from them. And then when you begin in a musical, after you've cast, after you've had a read through the first thing you do, if it was, like um I'm, like in a youth theater you're going to <clears throat> rehearse the music for two weeks um or 10 days if we have a six weeks then we're going to spend two weeks on all the dances and we're going to put all that together then we're going to spend two, four, six, um, two weeks on all the blocking then we're going to start to put it together scene by scene and you do not you never you never rehearse the entire thing until mm -hmm. it's time. So you do, it's just building blocks. So I, if it's me, I do act one, scene one. And then sometimes I look for the most difficult scene. So I get them started. Then I go, which one's the hardest here? Like the <laughs> most difficult okay. scene in Little Mermaid is the end of act one. Okay, so let's learn the choreography now and get that puppy out of the way. So we don't have to worry about that. We know it's gonna end at the end of act one beautifully. So then we, we jump, we do those first steps. We learn the music and we jump. And we go, now we're going to just go ahead and do this now and take it out and get it out of the way. 
Sometimes I've even done the end of the, the show just to get out of the way. Mm. My daughter said, mom, that's such a good method. I said, I've learned it through trial and error. Right. And it wasn't something I knew. And then you just slowly start to put it together. And um, it should, in my case, it would take them six weeks, but it depends on how long the script is 20 mm. minutes. It's not going to take you more than two weeks to put the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. um, and that also children are very interesting. Repetition is a wonderful thing. I've always said this. Why can they not remember this? Why are they? Because they need you to repeat it daily. Right. And then, and then you'll have somebody in the back row who knows everybody's lines, everybody's <laughs> blocking everything. And why isn't, you know, Janet doing such and such like you told her to Mrs. Smith, <laughs> you know, it's like, cause I, cause Mrs. Smith has completely forgotten that she has to even do that thing. Right. You know? But he thought that was really cool when she put her arm up and yelled, you know what I mean? Yeah. You always have those kids. That's the, that's the process that you normally follow. Mm -hmm. Um, and you do the same thing when you're blocking a play, you're going to, you know, you're going to audition, you're going to read it. You're going to um, start at the beginning, then you're going to do it in small pieces. Yeah. It depends on how much they can take, but you never rehearse the whole thing um, until it's time until you're like coming up on it, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we need to take it apart first. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for breaking that down because I, that was super helpful because Good. I know when you're just looking at this musical and you're like, okay, there's so much in here. How do I unpack it? And that's where well, the actually, overwhelm comes from. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that, Jessica, because I'm going to write, I have to write a blog post by next week and I am going to write it on this subject because Perfect. It, for me, it like makes so much sense because I've done it for mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. but I forget, oh, you haven't. Or yeah. like I heard a high school teacher goes, I'm going to start in my middle school teaching them theater history first. I said, oh, please don't, please do not do that. You will kill them with this. Mm. They won't, just, just find the fun in it first. Just, just, right. just enjoy it first. Um, and I forget, I'm sure I was the same way. In fact, I know I was when I started. Yeah. So before I tell everybody where to find you, I want you to give any other advice about maybe anything we talked about or any other advice you have around drama education or how to integrate it with music education. I always tell any teacher, remember, you always know more than they do. Even if you learned it that night and you come in the next morning, you always know more than they do. And it, you never have to worry about that. And if some student, I'm talking about up through middle school, you're going to get in high school and there's going to be some student who has decided he knows everything about Shakespeare. And perhaps he does. And I have no problem saying to kids, well, I had, I had no idea. I'd never learned that about, you know, I, I'd never mm -hmm. learned it that about this particular playwright. I don't have a problem saying that, but when you're, when you're working with the young kids, you always know more than they do. Yeah. I also tell people to over plan. I was taught that in college over plan. So you never have to worry. You have so mm -hmm. much ready or at least written down that if I still have time, we'll do X, Y, and Z. Then you're not like, <laughs> what, am yeah. gonna, what am I going to do? You need right. to think about um, their attention span, how long they can last on a particular idea. You know, if, if you want to work on a scene and you have 30 minutes, you're probably only going to do maybe two pages or three pages. How do you keep everybody else occupied? Well, it depends on the script. I only select scripts for kids where everybody is pretty busy. So maybe in this scene, they're the townspeople. And then the next scene, they play all the forest characters. And um, I'm much more interested in that. I try not to put them in. We've all seen these um, silly costumes that you see on commercials where the kids are dressed as a sunflower. I'm going, Evans, please don't do that to them. <laughs> You know, that's real cute for you. And grandma loves that too. But a child generally doesn't want to be dressed as a sunflower, but you could put her in brown pants and a yellow t-shirt and put a yellow hat on her head or a brown hat on her head. And she's still a sunflower. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, keep it simple. Um, sometimes we just, you don't need to be insecure. You already know more mm -hmm. than you think you do. You know, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have anybody like that for me and yeah. to, for years. And in fact, Jessica, because of the nature of how I taught, I never had a student teacher because I was such a specialist. And at one point I was teaching a hundred new kids every 25 days in a pre 
elective in a middle school for 13 years, I did that. And in the last schools I taught in, these were home, it's a homeschool enrichment program, but they would see, we would see like four, well, I would see kids for four days a week. So I would see up mm -hmm. to 400 kids a week in that 16 different preps, if you think about it, because of mm -hmm. different schools. There was a point where I directed four musicals at once. It sounds so um, maybe crass, but it is a, a job. It is not supposed to take over your entire life. Right. And you don't want to get to the end of this and you missed out on this moment with your son or mm -hmm. your mother's birthday, you know, or your friend's weekend away you have got to just learn that it's a job and you want to do it well but you have these things at least a lot of schools do which are uh, professional days and they give you days at least in the schools I've worked at where you can use it the way you need to if you mm -hmm. need to go a personal day if you need to go to the doctor that's fine and if you just want to sit in bed and just watch television for the day to rest that's your deal you get to do it use those days yes. use your sick days please do not try to be a warrior. It does not help. I would also say whatever you're worried about, probably it's going to work out in the long run. And although I say I am not a member of the good enough club, sometimes good enough is great. And mm -hmm. take it easy. We want you to last a long time. We don't want you to quit after two years and go, this is too hard. You know, self-imposed um, pressure that you're putting on yourself. It's yeah. okay. You just don't have to. Yeah. Oh, I love all of that. Thank you so much for that advice. You're so welcome. helpful. So needed. And what a breath of fresh air. Thank you. You're so welcome. I want everybody, I know they're going to want to connect with you after this episode. So let everybody know where they can find you online, find your amazing products and all the things you're doing that is happening in the world that I would love for you to share. Well, certainly. If you go to, if you're looking for blogs, I'm on <clears throat> at WordPress at www.dramamamaspeaks, and it's D-R-A-M-A, -A, then M-O-M-M-A -M -M -A, speaks. There's a story behind why it's called that. And um, you will find me at Drama Mama Speaks on my blog. You will find me at, on Instagram under, I think it's under Drama Mama Speaks. You'll find me under Deborah Baldwin. I have a, a website. It's DebraBaldwin.net. I'm there. You'll find me in Facebook under Drama Mama Speaks. Uh, Instagram, you will find me for sure. Oh, on Teachers Pay Teachers, I'm under Drama Mama Speaks. Just make sure you have mama spelled right. Mm -hmm. And it's good. It's M-O-M-M-A. I, I make new products constantly. I just finished one yesterday and went, oh, yeah, that ought to be part of that unit. Why didn't I think of that? You know, I... I refine things and people would be excited because I'm moving slowly down to kindergarten, but mm. I'm just kind of testing things out. I'm down to second grade and going, is that too much? No, I think it's okay. You know, I'm just slowly up through 12th. So well, I'm there everywhere, wherever you need me. And please feel, people should feel free to email me or um, catch me on Instagram or through Facebook. I'd be happy to try to help you. I'm going to say try, cause you never know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I hope I gave it all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And all those links will be in the show notes. So make sure you connect with Deb. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, welcome, I Jessica. love this conversation. Oh, I loved it, doing it with you. Thanks again. Well, hey there. Thank you so much for listening into the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. There is an exclusive Facebook group just for listeners of this podcast and any elementary music teacher called the Elementary Music Teacher Community Facebook group. Come on over and join us there where we have conversations around the podcast episodes and encourage each other each and every week. And also head to my website, thedomesticmusician.com. I have some free resources there that you can download to help you gain traction in your classroom today as well as the blog and the membership site and all kinds of other goodies to help you keep going in your music teaching journey. I cannot wait to keep connecting with you and encouraging you and spurring you on in your journey of teaching elementary music. Hang in there, have an amazing week, and I will see you soon.